Welcome to the Bridging Science and Faith Roundtable on the relationship between mind, body, and soul. Dr. Michael Murray, President, Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, will lead this discussion, which is part of the Bridging Science and Faith Project, supported by the John Templeton Foundation. On behalf of the Cura Foundation and the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Culture, I'd like to welcome you to today's roundtable discussion focused on the relationship between mind, body, and soul. This session is part of the Fifth International Vatican Conference, and this Bridging Science and Faith series is brought to you with support of the John Templeton Foundation. My name is Dr. Michael Murray. I'm Senior Visiting Scholar at Franklin and Marshall College and President of the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Joining me is an esteemed cross-disciplinary panel of world's leading experts on this topic. Our panelists today are Dr. Dr. Justin L. Barrett, President of Blueprint 1543 and Honorary Professor of Theology and the Sciences at St. Andrews University School of Divinity. We're also joined by Dr. Paul Bloom, the Brooks and Suzanne Reagan Professor of Psychology at Yale University, and Dr. Julian Mussolino, Associate Professor of Psychology at Rutgers Uni University. And finally joining us is Dr. Timothy O'Connor, the Malin Powell Professor of Philosophy at Indiana University. It's important before we get started to say a few words about exactly what it is we're talking about here today. For if we don't start with some conceptual ground clearing, it's easy to talk past each other. While there's not much confusion about what it means to have or to be a human body, things aren't so clear with respect to the soul. Do we mean by the soul, the seat of cognition and emotion, the source of our individual identity, the things that survive our bodily death, some ghost in the machine, for sure, religious traditions have articulated different conceptions of the soul, and individuals use the word soul to designate different things. But for the purposes of this panel, we'll use the term soul to refer to some aspect of our individual identity that's not reducible to and can't be explained in physical terms. That is, it refers to aspects of our personhood or mental life that can't be accounted for by appealing to the entities and laws that are countenanced in physics or chemistry or biology. So the soul, if there is such a thing, is that part of us that's not physical. One might think that this entails that souls are immaterial entities or objects that causally interact with the physical body, and that this entity or object is entirely detachable from the physical body. That notion of the soul, defended by thinkers like Plato, Augustine, and Descartes, is one that's widely adopted, and it's probably the view that most individuals in the West think of when they think of the soul. Philosophers call this view substance dualism because it proposes that we humans consist of two dual substances. But there are other conceptions of the soul as well. For example, some hold that while only physical things or objects exist, those physical things can have or manifest two types of properties, physical properties and non-physical properties. The physical properties are things we're familiar with like mass and charge and length but on this view, we also have non-physical properties, and these properties explain aspects of ourselves that are not reducible to the physical. So that might include things like consciousness. This view is often called property dualism. And I'll mention just one more variety of dualism, and there are many, in part because I know it's a favored view of one of our panelists. And this view is sometimes called emergent dualism or emergentism. On emergentism, the non-material elements of ourselves come into being as the result of the coming together of a certain configuration of matter. Uh, these elements aren't themselves physical, but when they, but they come into being when the physical elements are arranged in a certain way. And this notion of emergence is uh, known outside of uh, so the sciences of the mind. It's widely embraced in physics and chemistry, for example. So the phenomenon of the chemical bond that exists between atoms in a molecule, the thing that holds the H and the O together in H2O, seems to be a real feature of the chemical world. And yet there's no way to reduce the phenomenon of the chemical bond to the fundamental quantum mechanical elements that make up the atom. When these quantum mechanical elements get together, the phenomenon of the chemical bond just pops up, although we can't explain it in terms of those underlying quantum mechanical features of the atom. Something similar, some argue, is true with respect to at least some elements of our personhood or mental life. While the human person might require a physical body and brain to exist, when that body and brain come together, new and non-physical features emerge or pop up 
including things like consciousness or agency or free will and so on. These can't be reduced to the physical, the emergentist argues, and so they're non-physical. And these non-physical features constitute our souls. So right off the bat, we can see this is complicated. Well, now that I've made it complicated, let me turn it over to the experts. And to begin, I'll ask a couple of our panelists to speak to my first question. So in a recent survey, that nearly 30% of academic philosophers say that they accept or lean in the direction of a non-physicalist understanding of the human person or the mind. But a recent survey of elite tier scientists indicates that less than 10% do. Now that is an overwhelming support in either case, but it's a significant difference. So why do some philosophers think there are good reasons for souls while scientists think not? So let me first ask Tim to comment on behalf of the philosophers. Um, why do those philosophers who think that there are good reasons to believe in something non-physical about us, a soul, why do they believe that? And then I'm gonna ask Julian to tell us how things look from the view, his viewpoint as a scientist. So Tim, would you lead us off? Yeah, so the, there seem to be powerful um, philosophical reasons to reject the materialist or uh, physicalist vision of, of human nature. Um, thought experiments, uh, many philosophers take to show that materialism can't account for several basic features of ourselves and of uh, animals to whom we are, of course, biologically connected. Um, for such features, uh, we, we have a rich range of conscious experience. Um, so consider Mary, the famous imagined neuroscientist of the future, uh, with a, who has a comprehensive understanding of the neural underpinnings of conscious experience, um, perhaps owing to a misfortune of having academic psychologists as parents who were eager to do cutting edge experiments um, without human subject review board oversight, Mary has grown up imprisoned in a monochrome environment. So imagine this, a scientist raised all her life in a monochrome uh, environment. Um, so ironically and tragically, while Mary knows everything about the physical basis of color experience, she herself has never had color experience. One day her captors slip up, she escapes to the colored world and sees a bright red rose and thinks to herself, so that's what the experience of red looks like. So notice she, she intuitively uh, learns the intrinsic character of red experience for human beings under normal lighting conditions and so on, um, despite having previously known all of the physical facts underlying this experience. Uh, it seems that this simple thought experiment brings out that the intrinsic character of our experience of color is something additional to its physical underpinnings in the visual cortex of the human brain. Uh, and what goes for the experience of color goes for sound, taste, or the equilocation of bats uh, that we have no capacity to grasp what that's like. Um, we have no plausible materialist account of any of these qualities of experience. And this is not merely a point about current physical science. Uh, physical science, generally speaking abstractly, describes structures and the dynamics that structures undergo. Um, but the look of redness or the taste of brie cheese or a sharp sensation of pain simply isn't captured by complex neural description. Uh, more briefly, there are there are three other plausibly anti-materialist, you might say, aspects of ourselves. We are subjects, not merely objects. So all the many elements of our experience at any given time, the colors and shapes, sounds, odors, touch sensations, kinesthetic sensations, all of these are very different and generated in distinct regions of the brain we now know. And yet they, they coexist in one overall experience of a single subject. Uh, again, I, I claim we have no plausible prospect for a materialist understanding of how these many experiential elements processed in distinct regions of the brain become united in one subjective experience. Um, third, we consciously understand some things Alas, not everything. Um, the computers that right now are facilitating this conversation process, uh, an enormous amount of information. 
but computers don't grasp meaning. They don't understand the information that they store that we potentially can access via them. Programs, computer programs and databases are constituted at bottom by, by many ones and zeros and the logic gates by which computers are designed to structure them. Digital encoding of information in the, of this sort um, does not constitute understanding. States of a mind that are about or directed at the world or, or at some abstract content in thought. Neuroscience is steadily progressing towards an understanding of how the marvelous human brain stores and continuously processes information. But what it doesn't and seemingly cannot fully account for is the sometimes result of this processing in our conscious awareness and understanding. Uh, and finally, I would say that we are purposive agents who are free to choose in a way that makes a difference for good or bad uh, in our own lives and the lives of other people. We have uh, a pervasive experience of an apparent freedom to choose what to do now or in the future. Uh, this is limited in many ways, of course, we are not gods. Um, and we, we presuppose uh, that we really possess this freedom in our responses to one another by holding one another to account for our behavior. So our, our ability to freely form the goals that we have uh, and to act creatively uh, upon those goals like conscious experience, subjectivity, and understanding plausibly doesn't reduce to non-purposive, non-thinking, and unconscious activity of the physical elements that compose us. Uh, and of course, where one goes from there, as Mike noted, is fair game for theoretical debate. Julian, you've uh, written a book called The Soul Fallacy, which deals with a number of these arguments. Um, yes. Can you tell us a bit about how uh, you understand this subject? Sure. Well, first, I'd like to point out that uh, regarding this notion of physical or non-physical or material or non-material, that these are not questions that working scientists worry about. Uh, working scientists try to explain how the world works. They used to worry about that historically. So the, towards the beginning of the scientific revolution, uh, during what was called the mechanical philosophy of Gallo and Descartes, they had a pretty clear conception of what material and physical meant anchored in our intuitions. Essentially, physical and material was Descartes' uh, first substance, res extanza, right? Very intuitive. Um, and they tried to explain the world in terms of the first uh, of this substance. Now, Descartes bumped into uh, problems. He couldn't explain aspects of the mind and everything. So he proposed a second substance. Uh, now, when Newton came along, uh, when he wrote his Principia in 1687, he did worry a lot about the uh, agent that he called gravity. He worried that it somehow seemed to occur at a distance, unmediated, and he worried whether it was material or immaterial, if you read the footnotes. But that's old stuff. We don't worry about these questions anymore, uh, for the most part, because they're not scientific terms and they're not very precise. If you look at definitions of physicalism, for example, you'll have all kinds of definitions of physicalism. Is it reductive, non-reductive, a priori, you know, uh, ontological, this and that. So this is not something that working scientists worry about. One way to think about this is something like this. So if you ask a scientist what's physical, they'll tell you, look, it's whatever we propose for the purposes of scientific uh, explanation. If it means we have to invoke particles without mass, then that's physical. If it means we have to invoke a Higgs field, then that's physical. Uh, and that's it. We don't worry about those questions. Now, uh, Tim is right that there are things that we don't understand. So, for example, there's one aspect of consciousness uh, that seems to be a puzzle the so-called hard problem, first-person subjective experience. But uh, not everybody thinks that actually it's a real problem. There are people who think, for example, that the problem is going to go away as our science progresses. There are people who think that will never go away. There are people who think that eventually we'll be able to understand it. And there are people who think that we'll never be able to, to understand it. 
So the idea would be if it's something that we need to appeal to in order to explain some feature, some phenomenon of our personhood or our agency or our uh, conscious life, then if we need to invoke those things, then we as the scientists can regard those as part of our toolkit and, and yeah. also part of the physical. Yeah. Uh, because anything that we're going to invoke that has these kind of causal influences in the world counts as physical. Um, in some sense, yes. I mean, right. The, the, the game is to try to explain things. And uh, again, if you scientists don't typically worry about ontological questions or the, the ontological status of the entities that propose, if you push them and ask them, you know, are these things real? Yeah, there's a sense in which they're real. Sure. But also, again, real means all kinds of things. Uh, it, the, the, I think an important thing in, in this discussion is that there are certain terms that we're going to use which are not scientific terms in the sense that they're not defined precisely. And so they're, they're, they're open to all kinds of interpretations and they yield very often all kinds of problems. On the other hand, there are things which can be couched much more precisely uh, in scientific terms. And I think that's one important difference between our sort of everyday ordinary concepts, uh, which form a very bad basis for scientific uh, theorizing and scientific concepts, which are different, much more precise and so on and so forth. So Tim, let me ask you to follow up on that briefly. I mean, is it fair to say if these are properties or uh, or entities that the scientists of the mind needs to appeal to, then then they'll just count them as physical, and there's no need to appeal to anything more than that. Uh, no, I, uh, um, that that is. I mean, sure, you can. We we can use words as we like. We can expand meanings, and so we could choose to count physical anything that makes a difference in our world. Right. But by that definition, um, if there were a, you know, if there's a supernatural God who sustains all things and, and occasionally intervenes in the course of nature, we'd say, oh, this is a weird physical phenomenon <laughs> that occurs. Right. Intuitively, that's not the case. So I guess the way I would I think it's helpful to focus it this way um, to say there's a non-physical um, regular, a non-physical um, uh, set of influences at play in the world if the ordinary behavior of the fundamental constituents of the world as they co-evolve right through space and time, if that doesn't fully determine everything that happens. So you start, that's, that's what I would mean by reduction. Everything, does everything in some sense reduce to, is it, is it settled by the underlying physics so that everything else that, that we observe is just a kind of coarse grain pattern running through the world <clears throat> but that's set, that's settled at, at the fundamental level. Um, and so on a kind of an emergentist vision of things, um, under certain kinds of, of uh, circumstances of organized complexity, and we, we learn about these empirically, right? There become uh, factors that influence, that uh, structures give rise to powers and capacities that don't reduce to the elemental physics. I guess the, the one thing though, I, I, think, I, think, I think you're right. I wanna agree with you on one thing. Uh, I think it's appropriate for working scientists, say neuroscientists, physical scientists, um, not to worry about, as you say, any alleged non-physical influences. Uh, and the reason for that is that if there are such influences, we're only going to be able to get a scientific handle on them if we have a really good understanding of the underlying dynamics that give rise to them. And so we're still at a, you know, I wouldn't, I don't know, early stage. We're at maybe a mid stage in our neurophysiological understanding of the way the brain works. We understand very well cell to cell communication, but large scale neural network dynamics is something we're, we're just slowly getting a handle on. Um, so both the emergentist and the reductionist predict that the way forward is to do good reduction-minded science. Uh, and so scientists ought to be, um, you might say, methodological reductionists. And then if they think eventually uh, the emergentist predicts, they'll come up against certain limits. Um, and that's where the things get interesting. Justin, are you wanting to weigh in? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I just... Um... I guess what I wanted to add was uh, maybe a caution because um, uh, speaking for the psychologists, um, there's something a little bit makes us a little nervous to suggest that if uh, that all of the mechanisms and all of the entities we talk about somehow are physical just because we're doing science on them. So we talk about the dynamics of beliefs, feelings and other kinds of states. 
And we don't pretend that they're physical. We pretend we, we assume at certain points that they in some ways are subserved by physical kinds of systems or instantiated in physical systems, but that doesn't make them physical systems. Um, but I would applaud that kind of, I'm, I think we do progress well with a certain kind of methodological reduction, but I'm nervous about conflating that with a physicalism, at you know, a methodological physicalism, because we certainly don't do that with mental states as far as I could tell. And that's not what we're, we're not calling mental states physical in that moment, but maybe I misunderstood Julian and Tim's points on that. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. So what, what scientists do is they pick a level of analysis because of course that's a very important uh, idea, right? Uh, and they're free to do so uh, without constraints. And then they can propose mechanisms or ideas uh, at that level uh, that hopefully will enter into explanation. Um, again, labeling them physical or non-physical, that's perfectly fine, but I don't think it adds anything to the explanation or um, Justin, you're right. If we want to call mental things, you know, non-physical, I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, and uh, so that, that's what we do, right? So in, in case of the mind, it turns out that um, the way we understand it uh, is that it's a way of talking about the body and brain at some level of abstraction at which we have proposed a number of mechanisms that enter into sometimes very uh, impressive uh, explanations. On the question of reductionism, um, one question we have to ask ourselves is, so do we, do we invoke these higher levels? We all work at, the, at levels higher than uh, element, elementary particles. We're not all quantum field theorists here. Um, so we invoke things like beliefs and so on and so forth. And that's perfectly fine. It is perfectly scientific and explains a lot of things. But now we've, if we ask, do these things reduce to the physical? Well, what do we mean by that? One thing we can mean is, do we propose these higher level notions for epistemic res reasons in the following sense? If we were Laplace type demons and have access to all the positions and uh, momentum of all the elementary particles in our bodies, would we be able to actually explain everything that we do? I don't think the answer is known. I see Paul has been uh, wanting to say something, raising his hand, so I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll let him. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're limiting because I'm going to agree with you. So you were well timed. Um, oh. and, and this is sort of taking what you said and, and taking a bit of a different direction, which is in the domain we're talking about, we're now talking to sort of the facts of not how what people think about, but what things really are. There's deep debates. So Tim actually, I think, very, very nicely outlined some features that are special, features like meaning and purpose and consciousness. And then he said, and I think correctly, computers don't do that. And I think that's right. I think the empirical claim. But I think that that's right. Then we could ask, um, what would one have to add to a computer so that it would do it? I think there's some people who would say, can't be done on a computer. You need flesh, maybe, or you need spirit or something that a computer lacks. Others might say, yeah, you know, add some more memory, program it right. Boom, we'll have a computer with purpose, uh, meaning, and consciousness. Those to me sound like excellent, interesting, important questions. But I share the sympathy that I don't think anybody's arguing against this of, of what Justin raised, which is arguing whether or not my dream is a physical event. I, you could say yes, you could say no, depending on how you use the word physical. I don't think that that stuff's going to be very exciting. I think that there's enough really hard problems, hard, hard problems in a David Chalmers way, but also hard problems in a regular, just gosh, hard problems for us to deal with. Yeah, I want to pivot to another line of questioning, but before I do, let me throw in one other comment. And if this turns out to be very controversial, then we won't pivot to the other line of comments. You have a chance to weigh in. But uh, mo most of you on this panel know that there are different ways of conceiving of this relationship between mental descriptions and physical descriptions. So on some, what people would like to have is a reductionistic account where the level of description uh, when we invoke uh, uh, terms like uh, experience or belief or volition or uh, whatever the mental category is can somehow be reduced to and so explained in terms of physical categories. Right? And for some, that's the ideal. And if we can't do that, then that shows that there's some level of reality over and above the physical stuff. 
Whereas others have held that these are just different modes of discourse. So we can describe the behaviors of a human person in terms of things like beliefs and desires and aspirations and goals and conscious experiences, or we can describe the behaviors of those, uh, those uh, human beings in terms of neurons and, and, uh, and, uh, and neural signals and, and so on and so on. And we shouldn't expect that there, we should be able to reduce one to another. They're just different modes of discourse. They run in parallel to one another. And, uh, and, we, and, the prospect of, and the project of reduction is broken back. We shouldn't be looking to reduce one to another. They're just different ways of describing the same phenomenon. So in the same way, when we look at a chess playing computer, we might be able to describe the moves that are being made by the chess playing computer in terms of the modes of discourse that a grand chess master would use about strategies and aims and so on. But what's going on at the level of the actual computer doesn't have anything to do with strategies and aims. There's no way of talking about the white strategy with respect to uh, taking the pawn that you can reduce down to electrical signals, right? That's just the wrong way of thinking about it. These are different modes of discourse. So some have argued that that's, that's the problem, um, is that those who are trying to reify these, um, these mental descriptions into some kind of thing that's over and above the physical misunderstand that these are just different modes of discourse. I think that's another way that some have looked at it. Um, if that's not too controversial, as Tim's making a <laughs> yes, but it makes me think he wants to weigh in. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, no, I don't want to try to take us a foot. Yeah. All right. Let me, let me, let me move us to something else. So um, while most academic philosophers and scientists, as I mentioned earlier, are I guess at best skeptical about the notion of the soul, the public at large is not. The vast majority of the public believes that there is some kind of soul that uh, is separate from the body and survives our bodily death. Um, Josh Green, the Harvard psychologist says, most people are dualists. Intuitively, we think of ourselves not as physical devices, but as immaterial minds or souls housed in physical bodies. So one question is why is belief in souls so pervasive? Are, are we hardwired to believe in souls? Um, Paul, you've written in your book, Descartes' Baby. Uh, I, think the, I think the description is that we're natural born dualists. So perhaps you can say something about that. Are we natural born dualists? And uh, if so, why? Yeah, I think we are. Um, and it's important here, we've been talking about a lot of uh, subtleties, which I think deserve to be talked about. But the dualism that most people possess, and I would argue most people around the world, most people through history, is a form of extreme <clears throat> substance dualism that I think just about every psychologist and philosopher would have no truck with. The idea is that um, <clears throat> we, we, you know, we're not bodies, we have bodies. Um, we're souls, we're immaterial souls. When this body goes, my soul will persist with my beliefs and desires. I can leave my body, occupy another body, and if you ever go to any movie, any fantastical movie, a soul being a, a wonderful example, you'll see this is this common sense that you, 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 you can leave your body, you can survive the death of your body. When you ask people about um, certain mental functions like doing math, they'll often say that's done by the brain. Then you ask them things about like falling in love and envy, they say, no, that, that's done by me. That's not done by the brain. And they don't mean some sort of fancy pants way of description that the philosophers here would talk about. They mean it literally the brain doesn't do that. So, so why? Um, a perfectly plausible theory is it's due to the dominance of dualistic religions like, uh, like Christianity and people just pick it up like they pick up other things. I have several colleagues who would say that's in fact what happens. Um, my, my view is different. My view is that this is just a natural product of how the mind works. Um, I think it shows up in the universality of dualistic beliefs, even in cases where the sort of official doctrine is non-dualist. And I think it shows up uh, in as younger children, you can test. You know, you tell, you tell kids, you tell three-year-olds about, um, about a boy who has his brain taken and put in the head of a pig. And what they'll tell you is um, you have a very smart pig. But still, a pig who, who likes to do pig things. That doesn't go with the brain. The brain's just a smartness thing. Why do we have it? Well, nobody knows. Um, some people think that it's a biological adaptation, maybe involved in, the, in some advantages to envisioning life after death. I'm skeptical myself. I think it's kind of an accident. I think what happened is we've evolved two systems, one for dealing with sort of middle-sized physical objects, uh, naive physics, we call it. A second system for dealing with people, uh, a naive psychology, a theory of mind. 
And these two do not naturally mesh. So I look at all of you and I look at myself and, and, I, and, I, and I see the outputs of two systems. There's a physical body here and there's a mind. And the fact that they could be one and the same, it's like, there's always a moment where you're surprised to learn that when that, that, that hearing, that audition sound is just feeling vibrations. Because it, it's so it experience so different from feeling vibrations because we have two different systems and the input is so different. I think the same thing holds with dualism. I don't think we've I don't think there's an, an adaptive advantage to be dualist. I think we're just dualists because we've we've evolved in certain ways that makes the correct scientific conception of the mind untenable. Justin, I know you've done some work on these topics in your work on the cognitive science of religion. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think. Um... I'm with Paul on this one in terms of the broad brushstrokes. Um, I too think that, look, uh, some of the things that Tim was pointing us to, those kinds of uh, phenomenal experiences that we have, that there's a seat of will, that we make decisions, um, that we have conscious experience, sensations, emotions, feelings, all of this is easily handled by the system that deals with minds. Um, and we, very, or we see plenty of evidence that that's readily dissociable from bodies. Bodies may be a good cue that there's a mind being here if they have the right kind of faces or body shapes, things like that. But one of my favorite little sort of uh, uh, bits of evidence is that uh, a majority, it seems, of children before they're about age six have imaginary friends. Okay, these are friends that don't have visible bodies, they, but they do have uh, mental states, they have desires, they have beliefs, they have identity. And when we're talking about soul, really, we're not just talking about they can do sort of cognition, but that they have a, dis a, a distinctive identity that endures over time and yet no bodies. And they are not indoctrinated to believe in these sort of things. If anything, parents kind of are embarrassed and discourage these things, right? But there they are in the majority of kids, they just show up showing I think how easily it, it easy it is to think about minds without bodies. So I think Paul's right. I think what we've got is a conceptual path of least resistance due to the, just sort of the, the cognition that we've got naturally, the kinds of experiences that we have and trying to make sense of those. Do they get culturally scaffolded you know, through philosophical systems and theological systems? Yeah, and then we can see some diversity among the subtle versions of this uh, kind of dualism, but I think there's there, this is a path of least resistance kind of situation. And I want to add, and for that reason, I think we, we can forgive people for believing in a soul. Um, it sure looks like it. Um, and I think under some at least typical kinds of uh, epistemological considerations, we're entitled to those beliefs. They're delivered to us automatically by a system that looks like it's functioning properly in the kind of environments it ought to be working in. And lo and behold, it gives us this sort of impression that there's this enduring self that's associable from our bodies. Um, that makes me think that actually it's the scientists who have a, a burden of proof in showing that we don't, uh, and they're working on it. So. I'll just add to, to Justin's uh, great summary that kids have imaginary friends. Adults, many adults, most adults have got and I don't want to. I don't want to offend and say God's just a big imaginary friend. But in this regard, the fact that we can, that we as adults can naturally conceptualize an immaterial yet sentient being, a pure soul, um, suggests is further evidence for the naturalness of this belief. Can I jump in and uh, um, add that? Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm very sympathetic to what I've heard uh, from uh, Paul and. Uh, and Justin here, in fact, Paul's work has greatly influenced my own and, uh, and when I wrote the, the, the Soul Fallacy. I'd like to extend this because I think what we heard from them um, applies to a broader range of, of, uh, of questions. So we talked about the intuitive understanding that we have of the mind and the body versus the scientific understanding that we have. And we see that there's a difference. Intuitively, we are dualists. Uh, we're not substance dualists. I mean, scientists are not substance dualists. Um, if you look, say, now at uh, intuitive physics, for example, right, Paul mentioned intuitive physics, it's not at all like scientific physics. So intuitive physics is mostly Aristotelian. So people have this notion of impetus that if you want an object to move, you kind of have to push it. If you stop pushing, it stops moving. The notion of inertia, as in Newton's principle of inertia, is very counterintuitive, not to mention anything relativistic or quantum. 
take now uh, our understanding of uh, evolution. So uh, our understanding, our folk understanding is essentialistic, creationistic. Our scientific understanding is none of the above, but it goes even further. Um, there's uh, somebody who I'm sure you all know here, Pascal Boyer, who has a great book called Minds Make Societies, in which he makes the claim that we also have a folk understanding of economics and sort of like uh, trade relations. And now we live in a world in which we have extraordinarily complicated economic and financial systems about which we have very little intuitive understanding. So what fascinates me is this gap between our folk theories and the, and the kinds of scientific theories that we've been able to develop, which are very, very, in fact, in any of the mature sciences, completely at odds with our um, intuitions. And this creates all kinds of problems, I think. And Paul is someone who I know has written about this uh, uh, you know, in a number of uh, publications. So I think the point that, the, that Justin and Paul made is just really, really interesting and much broader, I think, uh, applies to a broader range of, uh, of, uh, of questions. Yeah. Justin, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, Julian, I think you've you've captured that right. Um, there's there's I don't want to be the caution guy. Here's the caution though. Um, again, and that is yep. there's something a little different about the domain of what we'd call folk psychology or mentalizing theory of mind, and that is beliefs are part of it. And so, what happens if we scientifically can show that, oh, beliefs aren't what you think they are. That kind of conscious assent to a, a proposition or some kind of idea isn't what you think it is. Well, then who's believing that claim, mm. right? There's, a, there's a, an almost cutting off the limb you're standing on kind of property to explaining mental states as, oh, they're not what you think they are. That isn't there for physical or biological systems. And that's where the philosophers come right back in the door again and start, you know, telling us we need to be careful. Yeah. I agree, Justin. I wasn't saying that it's necessarily things like beliefs or desires that uh, are part of our folk ontology, but not part of our, it's certain sort of theories. Like, so for example, the relationship between mind and body, for example, right? That seems to be intuitively understood one way as you and Paul described beautifully and have done great work on versus the way that we theorize about it in, uh, you know, in, 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 in uh, scientific uh, work. But you're right that in scientific work, at least in psychology, yes, we also invoke things like a mental level with beliefs and desires. Um, and we don't want to say there that, uh, yeah, they're part of our explanatory uh, toolkit, at least for now and maybe for a long time. So yes, I agree, you have to be careful about what we say or what we claim uh, clashes between our scientific understanding and our folk understanding, for sure, for sure. Justin, let me come back to a comment that you made a minute ago when you said, so we need to forgive folks for having these beliefs because it, they're naturally disposed to forming them. Uh, but of course that implies that they need to be forgiven for it. But at the end of those comments, you said, on the other hand, when it comes to these beliefs that seem to form under natural conditions, when our cognitive faculties are functioning in the right way, um, that there's a, um, uh, I guess there's a, um, we, we have to regard those beliefs as being justified until we have reasons to think otherwise, right? So, the, so the, we should presume that they're innocent until proven guilty, in which case you wouldn't need to be forgiven for holding them. So do we need to be forgiven for holding soul beliefs or is in fact, <laughs> That the belief, is that the belief we should go with until we have reason to think otherwise? Uh, I think the latter. I think that these, uh, when we've got, uh, I think that the automatic deliverances of our cognitive faculties, when they're working the way they seem like they should be working in the domains in which they seem to be, that's what they're supposed to do. We're entitled to those beliefs. So you're right. I shouldn't have said we can be forgiven. I meant that in sort of flippant way. Um, those have that innocent until proven guilty quality. I think just like perceptual beliefs, are there conditions under which our perceptual systems lead us astray? Sure. But we generally trust our, you know, that right now I'm trusting that I'm seeing sort of people, but I'm also trusting that those are minded beings because that mentalizing system is automatically making attributions of mental states uh, consciousness, beliefs, desires, and so forth to the rest of you. And I'm entitled to those beliefs too. 
it seems to me. Those are innocent until proven guilty. And then it's, uh, so the, what I'm suggesting is the burden of proof is on the naysayer. Um, when Can I be the cautious guy guilty. now, uh, Justin, if you don't mind? Um, so I, so I want to push you a little bit on what you just said about this burden of proof. So suppose I take what you said at face value and tell you that I had a very powerful dream last night, very powerful subjective experience that there was some kind of monster under my bed. I don't think you'd want to say there that I should take the reality of the monster under my bed at face value and say, well, prove me otherwise, right? So we, I think, do you see what I mean? Uh, yeah, well, but you framed it as a dream state, and we already have reason to believe that dream states are not veridical. Ah, but you we see, we don't already have reason to believe that the attribution of minds to other people is non-veridical. For instance, mm, I thought you were making a. I, I see the point. I thought you were making a broader claim here about. Uh, well, so take the case of the of the soul, right? So now we say. So if we have a subjective impression or feeling that the world works a certain way because it's not just that we're saying that we have beliefs and we feel a certain way we're really making a claim based on the first person perspective about what's out there and how the world works and here i want to ask you do you think that given what we know about science do you think that we should automatically think that simply because we have a strong intuition about how the world works uh it should be held until proven guilty. I'm not so sure I would want to follow you there if that's what you mean, but maybe that's not what you mean. Uh, Tim wants to save me from myself. I think. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, the, the, yeah, the only thing, I mean, this is fascinating research uh, on uh, the, the sort of our native dispositions. Um, I, I think I'm echoing a point Justin was making and saying, we, we can't go so far as to say we're, we're so radically subject to illusions or false falsity of beliefs that we end up undermining the, the very epistemological basis of science itself. Sci science, right, fundamental to all science is scientific activity, right? And our conception of scientific activity is of conscious, you know, aware agents who form purposes and plans and communicate and know what they're doing, et cetera. Uh, and sometimes when people sort of diss the folk, folk psychology of mind, right, they say, well, it, it's just shot through with pervasive illusion. The even conscious experience itself is not at all what we experience it as, right? The, the, the experience of volition is, doesn't correspond to any real uh, dynamics in the unfolding of human behavior, that sort of thing. Uh, then again, you, you will undercut um, uh, our, our reasons for, for believing that science is a reasonably reliable, if fallible, uh, method of, of inquiry into the world. Uh, and, and I guess what I would sound on, you know, the naive physics stuff, or, and of course there's naive biology too, apparently, um, it's not completely wrong. If it were pervasively through and through wrong, We'd be we wouldn't survive right we couldn't engage with the world we certainly wouldn't get anywhere in doing science at at a very general level it's right it presupposes a world of objects that endure reasonably you know long periods of time interact and certain have influences and so forth and this is the case it's just the details right which no doubt our minds evolved our you know our those of our ancestors evolved in a kind of naive encounter with the world, right? That's not well suited to under, uncovering detailed understanding of very, a very complex world. And so similarly, I would say, you know, naive psychology, uh, it might well be, I, I believe, uh, the, the, the naive tendency to, to be a kind of really stark dualist, that may be mistaken. And a lot of other assumptions we make about the separability of cognitive function from the brain, that sort of thing. And yet the idea that there is a subject that endures, that is aware uh, of you know, my own states that acts upon the world, this, this I don't take to be mistaken, but this, that, that's enough to raise really difficult challenges to a kind of materialist outlook, I think. I wanna raise that, one more. That, that's I just quickly jump in, sort of supporting this. The late philosopher Jerry Fodor uh, made this argument over and over again with our tendency to, to get, uh, explain others' behavior in terms of beliefs and desires. And he emphasized how extraordinarily successful this is. And the fact that it's very, very successful at both explaining and predicting people's behavior is a good reason to believe it's right. 
We do possess beliefs and desires. A proper theory of the mind would include at some level, however, instantiated beliefs and desires. I might think that the body-soul dualism we're talking about is of a different flavor. I think if there was a, if there was a mutant who, if there was a person who couldn't think in terms of beliefs and desires, they would be so screwed in the world. And mm -hmm. some people with severe autism can conceptualize their beliefs and desires and they have extreme difficulties with uh, uh, social interaction. On the other hand, if one of us had some sort of virus in our heads or operation where we were no longer intuitive dualists, we were intuitive materialists, I don't think it would harm us at all. I don't think we have any, any damage, any negative consequences at all. And so if we're making the argument here, which I think is a good argument, if it works, we should give it respect. I think this applies better for beliefs and desires than for immaterial souls. Uh, Justin, really briefly. <laughs> um, I like the way that Paul is going with that, but I, I want to suggest that the building blocks that the, the soul idea sort of is built on or the foundational pillars probably are all of those things that we want to keep. And I think there are some cases in which like a Capra syndrome where the, the essence of uh, this is the condition in which I think that somebody who is familiar to me is an imposter, but they're physically the same, they're acting the same as normal, but there's some kind of missing essence that makes that person them. And I think that gets very close to that idea of the soul. And without that, suddenly our social relations are disturbed. If it's, if it's to me, I don't have that sense of continuity of self. There are all kinds of interesting ethical problems that get wrapped up into this. I might say somebody 10 years ago isn't that person. And so then they're not liable for their you know, atrocities they've committed. There are all kinds of interesting problems that at least an enduring self, and I take it from Michael's introduction, that's what we're talking about as a soul, however it gets manifest. And it sure seems important and functional. Um, but on our last, our last few seconds here, I wanna ask this, uh, th this question. Uh, here we are at the fifth International Vatican Conference. Um, one thing that is probably important are the religious implications of the question we're talking about here. So, so why does any of this matter? Why is this important? Or is it important at all, uh, theologically? Uh, as some of you know, theologians have been wrestling with the question of the importance of physicalism and dualism in a theological context. So can I invite either Tim or Justin to say a few words about whether or not the issue of physicalism and dualism is important theologically? Yep, Tim. Uh, so the, the, the Hebrew and Christian Bibles uh, that underpin Jewish and Christian theology speak of the soul, I, I believe, in functional rather than ontological terms. Uh, the language of the soul is meant to signal that every human person is of great moral worth, that we bear responsibility for our attitudes and actions, and that we have a supernatural and everlasting destiny in which, at least according to Christian theology, we will be transformed by becoming more fully um, the human beings that we were meant to be. And so then the question for theorists is what would need to be true of us, we ensouled creatures for such claims to make sense, uh, it's natural to uh, have the kind of platonic, sharply dualist conception for religious believers because it gives a neat and tidy account of all this. Um, but uh, many contemporary religious philosophers and theologians have argued it, it isn't necessary. Even survival of death with a little imagination is conceivable for beings who are at bottom biological organisms. Um, and so that's it's, something matters here, but not necessarily the Platonic conception. Thanks. Well, as you, uh, you can tell, there's a lot more to say. It's been a fascinating discussion. I want to thank you all for joining us here today, gentlemen.